alternators. We're going to do that and then we'll take a break. So what is an alternator? We've got two different setups here. This is the vanilla every boat setup. 98% of boaters have this setup. You got an alternator daisy chain to a starter solenoid post. Starter solenoid post to a switch. If you don't have a switch, you have to have a switch. Not everyone has a switch, which is crazy. You have to have a switch. And then you have a battery. That's, that's it, 99%. That's how they all come from the factory. That's what it is. So your alternator is going on the same short little wire that goes to the starter post. It's not literally the starter post, starter solenoid post, post but for simplicity, it's the same thing, and then it connects to the battery. Or you can have an alternator directly wired, unswitched, but fused. And notice if you actually have a alternator that is directly, you'll actually have a fuse on that circuit. If you have an alternator directly connected to a starter, there's no fuse on the circuit. You know those little red caps that are, in my opinion, because I always see them undone or pulled away, annoying on your engine? How many of us have those little red caps that are pulled back, probably the mechanic or someone, and not reinstalled on the post, right, on the starter post? I just want you to think about <laughs> your engine is completely a negative device. The whole thing is grounded, okay? Grounded. Everything about it is connected to the battery on the negative side. It's the return path, the whole thing. Why? Because it uses a path to go to ground, which is the water, effectively, to keep it, because a DC negative is not ground. The only way they're grounded is when the DC negative is connected to water. That becomes ground. If you have a positive wire, like, an in, like a starter cable or an alternator cable, that is directly connected to a battery, and on top of it, you don't even have a battery switch, which actually most boats from the 70s and 80s don't have, or if it's a rewired special from your previous owner who thought he was smarter than everyone else, and this could be an engineer, by the way. Like, engineers do incredible work on boats. Like, they're self-infused with knowledge as well, and they're like, they're mechanical, and suddenly they're just going, I know everything about everything in all spheres. The amount of rewiring I've done on boats is crazy. It doesn't matter what your background is, it's about doing it right, okay? If that battery or that point, that cable ever comes off, right? Especially on an alternator, think about the vibration on an alternator, right? That ever comes off and it lands on anything on the engine, which is a ground path return, that's it, you lost the boat, it's over. Game over, it's dead short. There's no amount of fire extinguisher that's going to solve this problem. You have a large cable going from the engine to the battery, large cable going on the positive side. You basically have a fire wire between the battery and that. And wherever that cable is, is going to ignite. It's going to be so hot. Whatever fiberglass wood, whatever's around it is going to ignite. And the boat's done. I mean, there's no amount of, you're, you're, it's, until the wire melts, literally shorts itself out, you're done. So positive post on starter solenoids or positive post, those little red caps on an alternator are absolutely essential, okay? Absolutely essential. And most of us, 90% of us, are going to have them just pulled away, right, and not reinstalled. Like they're on the cable. Yeah, go ahead. With that uh, diagram on the left there, if you flick off that switch while that engine is running, you're going to blow your alternator. That's right. Absolutely. And that, that's, how, that's a good point. When you actually, this switch actually, at the bottom of this switch, you have a switch from the 1970s. It says at the bottom, do not disconnect when engine is on or turning. Like it literally is labeled on every bottom of every switch. Because if you turn that switch off, when the engine is running and your alternator is running, it's like stopping a car with a wall. It works, no problem, your car will stop but you won't have a car to ever run again. Your alternator is done, finished, you gotta take the alternator, replace it. So, so it's absolutely essential, just one second, and we'll take more questions on the alternator, but it's absolutely essential, and that's the advantage with improved alternator wiring of bypassing the engine disconnect switch. Because most people, when they have a problem with their boat and they're running their boat, 
people start dialing in things. See it all the time. Something's not working. I wonder if it's the switch. The engine is running, right? You can turn off a diesel engine and have no power to it, and it's going to run, right? Not all fuel pumps are necessary, right? There's no fan. The engine will run. Like, you don't stop a diesel engine with actually stopping power to it. You actually choke it, like take the air off, right? So if you actually turn this off <clears throat> and the alternator is running, you're actually stopping suddenly the alternator hard, and you're actually going to blow up the alternator. The alternator is actually going to go to ground. It's actually going to fry the diodes. It's going to, it's going to find a way. So that's why this is improve alternator wiring. This is the common one, okay? All right, so let's, let's emphasize, and this is a common question. People say, Jeff, does my alternator work offshore power? Alternator, alternating current, they're both the same, right? I can see the, it's not a, it's, it's pretty common. I get this all the time in our presentations. No, your alternator will only work and will only create output if your engine is running. And at, honestly, on sometimes at a certain RPM. Some low RPMs, there's not enough self-excitation on the alternator to run at even idle. Like you need to ramp it up to 1200 RPM or something like that for the alternator to kick in. Not all ones, but some of them. Um, so generator or shore power have nothing to do with your alternator. A, shore a generator can have an alternator, and m most of them do. But again, you're not recharging your batteries with an alternator from a generator. You're running, we'll talk about generators later on. An alternator's purpose is to recharge the battery that started the engine or recharge another house battery. Some, bo some engines will have two alternators. One just for house, one just for engine. Or they'll have one alternator that recharges the engine and will find ways of re sending that current to another battery as well. And we'll talk about that later. So you might want to maximize your alternator output why? To you know, get your batteries recharged faster, especially if you don't have a generator. Or you might even have a generator, but you don't want to run it as often. Right? I've got boaters that have 60, 70 footers. We're putting out 300 amp, 24 volt alternators on there. They want to get to their destination with the batteries charged. They don't want to run their generator more than they need to. Right? Tons of owners that have Grand Banks 42, they've got a generator. They just, again, they want their alternators to do most of the work while underway. And it also provides redundancy. So here's the, this is the difference between marketing and reality. When someone says to you, I have a 55 amp alternator, or you're buying a 55 amp or 100 amp alternator, if it has an internal regulator, you will never see that output ever, period, under no circumstances. So if you walk through an Basically, all the reality is that, first of all, that's a cold rated. As soon as it gets hot, you derate by about 15%. So they're trying to do sort of like uh, your investment returns with your financial planner. You know, I promise you 12% growth, on all, and then you look after five years. Well, it didn't, well, yeah, but there's a lot of reasons. I mean, there's downturns. So they're coming out with best projections, but then it's like, oh, you use your alternator for longer than 15 minutes or half an hour? Oh, well, then you got to derate by 15%. Oh, you have an internal regulator? Oh, we're being cautious and it's kind of stupid because we don't have a brain, so we're going to be overly cautious. So we're going to derate by two thirds. And then we're also assuming that at 55 amps is actually maximum RPM, right? Because most alternators are wired for, wounded for cars, and that output is really at the top end of the RPM curve, right? So most cars don't run at 20 kilometers an hour, they're running at 100 kilometers an hour, and at that speed, the engine is rotating, I don't know, 4,000 RPM, and so they're on the high end of the spectrum. Most boaters are not running their diesel engines at 2,600 wide open throttle, like loaded. They're going maybe 21, some people are running at 1,400. So if you have a stock alternator, your, your stock alternator is gonna be low output at low RPM because it's a stock alternator. Stock alternators happen to be inexpensive. Of course, that's how they keep it. They just basically have ignition protected car alternators that they're putting on engines. Now, let's also refresh ourselves that there's a big difference between what you earn and what you save. I have boats where the alternator simply does not meet 
the demands of the boat. I had an owner with a symbol 55 that would leave Vancouver Harbor and could never make it past Secret Cove without his engines dying. And his engines would die because his ECM, his electric, electronic control modules for his engines, would actually die because the engine's battery would die. He had to run his generator to operate his boat underway because his alternators were too small. And that's just meaning demand, but as a boater, you might be going from A to B and saying, when I get to B, I want to have more of my batteries charged than less. And again, it doesn't matter so much for boaters that have a generator, but for boaters that don't, it's essential to get the most power you can have to recharge your batteries with a high output alternator. Need to make sure it's ignition protected. If you're gonna increase your alternator size, it's not trivial. You can't just do what you want. You need to make some decisions about what's the maximum size alternator and what are the loads that you're gonna put on the V-belt or the serpentine pulley on that engine. And then also look for an alternator that is wounded, which means it's not a high production number, right? I mean, they're, they're custom. For a high output, so look at the energy curve and look for an alternator that's giving a really good output for only 1200 or 1400 RPM, right? So here we've got an example of a stock alternator with a V-belt pulley and a serpentine alternator. Serpentine belts are the flat belts that all the cars nowadays have. Right, it's a flat belt. The V-belt is, of course, everything is old on a boat. Even new things are old on a boat. They just kept V-belts because most boaters or builders are not thinking about boaters that cruise, boaters that use their alternators as a way to recharge their battery banks. They're thinking alternators are there, like in our cars, to just maintain loads. Think about a boater, for example, in a place like California, right? Places where they don't have amazing cruising grounds like we do here, right? They're going from a marina to a marina to a marina. That's completely different boating than someone in Maine or someone in the Caribbean or someone here in the British Columbia that might go from one anchorage to another anchorage to another anchorage without ever connecting to shore power. And you can do that here in Vancouver in British Columbia or if you're in, in the Med or whatever, you can decide to not go to shore again to save money or because the destinations are not appealing to you. And how else are you going to recharge your batteries? If you don't have a generator, your alternator is one of the primary ways of recharging your batteries. This is also essential. Pulley alignment on a V-belt is utterly critical and also belt tension, right? So if you're driving a larger and larger alternator, you need to make sure that that V-belt is able to transfer the energy of the engine onto the alternator without slipping. Slippage on a V-belt causes heat, heat causes cracking, and eventually what's going to happen, you can have multiple scenarios that play out. One is actually the belt will actually disintegrate, and then you have no method of cooling your engine because there's no way of moving the water pump from a crankcase pulley. And the other issue, too, is that if you have V-belt slippage, what's actually happened is the heat actually, the alternator can handle some heat, but the water pump can't. And the water pump, because it's actually slipping on the water pump, will actually, you'll damage your water pump as well on your engine because you have a loose V-belt. So V-belt tensioning is absolutely important on a boat. And that's why when we go to high output alternators, we either do dual V-belts in the past. Now what we're doing is going to serpentine. So we'll put a kit, maybe about, you know, Canadian 800, 700, maybe 500 US, and we'll convert the front of the engine to a serpentine kit so that we can have what's called a high output uh, from, the, from the alternator. So basically that's what an alternator looks like. And any questions on, at all on alternators at this point? Yeah, one question, I'll come to you. Yeah. Okay, so what you're suggesting from this diagram here is that if we are wired as per the left side, which is what my vote is, yeah. I should actually be converting it to what's on the right hand side. You can, yeah. You, I mean, it's ideal for multiple reasons. Nope, it's just time. Other questions? So the diagram that's on the right, if you had, like, I've got three full. I've got starter batteries, thruster batteries, house batteries. So how would you... We are going to be talking about that in, in about, probably after lunch, I'll talk about how you recharge one alternator to do multiple battery banks. That is definitely a common problem. 
and we'll talk about that. Yes? Uh, on my sailboat, I've got a small A-horse uh, Yanmar diesel. Okay. So to upgrade to a larger output alternator, how does that affect the, host, the, the horsepower balance? Yeah, it's a great question. So if you have, it doesn't matter what size engine you have, at the end of the day, like especially you said eight horse? horse? Yeah, so, and on my boat I have a 30 horse engine. Like for example, a 90 amp alternator is five horsepower. So I have 30 horse, five, but there are maybe instances as a boater where I want literally 30 horses to get out of this jam that I'm in, right? Like it does happen where you need everything you can have to get out of a lee shore and you're, for whatever reason, things are not, you want all hands on deck for propulsion. When you buy an external regulator, it is possible, some of them, will, you can wire in a switch where you can actually say, deactivate the alternator for now or reduce the field voltage and say, I want the alternator to only work half of hard right now. So there's ways. Now for you, you would actually, that would be a variable. You're not gonna be able to put a 90, I mean, you'd lose more than half. So you're gonna have to figure out what's a reasonable compromise or maybe you have a button where when you're working at idle and you're recharging your batteries in an anchorage, which you shouldn't do on idle, but it is what it is. Some people have no other option than maybe having a five horsepower load is gonna be a good thing on your boat because your engine wants to run loaded. But then you'd have the ability of disabling that large load when you're underway. So more of the energy of the engine goes to propulsion than running the alternator. Yes? I don't, I, I don't show any grounds on any of this. No, but when you turn off the switch, you say it burns the alternator by essentially grounding the positive. Well, it's because the positive, oh, the alternator is uh, uh, connected to your engine. The engine is grounded. Yeah, but when you turn the switch off, it just connects the battery. That doesn't... Yeah, well, then the, the, all, the positive power from this engine is looking to complete the circuit. The, this, this wire here connects back to a battery, which connects it to ground. That's what this does, right? Through the battery. Through the battery. When you disconnect this, you're physically shutting off the circuit, but the alternator is outputting. It's looking for a path to ground. It will start freewheeling at that point. It will start freewheeling, but the electricity that was in the wire waiting to find a path back to ground, because that's what a circuit is, it's going back, you just disconnected it. So there's still positive coming out of this post, and it can't go anywhere. So it, the engine is grounded. The case of the alternator is grounded. It will go to case. It will, I, don't take my word for it. Every switch is labeled never disconnect while engine is running. Every single switch. The battery would stop charging. Well, the battery is gonna, obviously going to stop charging when the alternator actually blows up. Pardon? That's why you wouldn't disconnect the switch if the battery would stop charging. It would disconnect. That's the warning. No. No, no. It's not, the warning is not that you lose your charge rate. The warning is that you lose your alternator. But if you want to try it on your boat for experimental purposes and then share it on YouTube about your experience, I more than gladly would love to have an experience. Like if you want to do filming yourself and see how it works, or you could alternatively read online and see what other people are saying, but I, I can tell you it's not related to charging. Uh, no, you should not. <laughs> All right, any other questions before we take a break? So what about when you have a, a, a two position switch? House yeah, that's, a, starter, that's another good one. On yeah, yeah, that's a good one. You know, very good. Yeah, so that's a good one. So a common battery switch on a lot of boats is this off, one, two, both switch. Off, one, two, all. That switch, when it goes from one to all or two, is called a make before break switch. Make before break. That's literally the technical term. It means that it will hand off power. When you go from one to all, it's actually gonna to go to two and it's gonna to stay to one as you transition. And as when you go from all to two, it's actually gonna join two, stay there, and then it's gonna break one. So it's a make before break. Now, battery switches, nothing lasts forever, nothing. When you have a 30, 40 year old battery switch where the contactors are not great anymore, it is very possible that when you go from, you start on one and you go to all to recharge both batteries, because that's a common way of doing it. Certainly in the past, that's how you did it. 
You start on one and you're like, well, I want both batteries to get a charge, so I'm going to go to all. The make before break on an old battery switch can fail. Even if you break that for a millisecond, a break is a wall in front of your car is a wall in front of your car. When you disconnect your battery from an alternator when it's running, you lose your alternator. So that's why people, voters, have been either limiting their involvement of switching on old battery switch and finding other ways of charging batteries without actually moving the switch. And that is done through battery combiners or battery isolators. And we'll talk about both after lunch.